Welcome to the Epcotion Adventure, a podcast where we talk about all things Disney, but we're Epcot centered, including tips and tricks, festivals and favorites, and the very latest in our rankings and reviews. But we're still old enough to remember when a nickel could get you a bag of Fritos from the Frito Kid. This is episode 52, Disney Inventions, Things You Didn't Know Disney Invented. Or, I bet at least one of these things is going to surprise you. So now, please remain seated, keeping your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast as we embark on our Epcotion adventure. Howdy folks, and welcome to episode 52 of the Epcotion Adventure. I'm Rod. And I'm Sue. And today we're going to talk about a little known subject, and this is Disney inventions. Yes. So this is going to be things that were invented by, at, or for Disney. I think this is going to surprise a lot of people. There's a lot of things that people know that Disney invented or just assume they did in the theme parks, in the movies, on the theatrical stage. But you'll be surprised at some of the things that you use outside of Disney or that you see outside of Disney, even in other theme parks that started with Walt. Now, we're not going to talk about all of these things. Um, As we found out in our research, Disney holds over 6,000 patents and... That, that, that's a lot of paperwork right it, there. It's a whole lot. So we're not going to go into each one of those, obviously. <laughs> I probably would not even have any clue what most of them meant. But we did pick out a few of our personal favorites or ones that surprised us. And we're going to talk about those today. So hopefully something in here is going to intrigue you or uh, catch you by surprise. But yeah, so many things that we take for granted today or that we just assume has always been part of the entertainment industry, were invented by our good friend Walt Disney. So Yeah, let's start all (laughs) the way back in the past, back into the 1920s, which now we're in the 20s again. And that's weird. This is the wrong 20s again. Isn't that crazy? It is. I know, right? But back in the 20s, Walt and Roy started the Walt Disney Studios. And back in the day, they got ripped off. Oswald got stolen from them, and I think that's really led to what became the patents then for Disney. Yes, now to to... just go back a little bit, just to explain what you just said, if you don't know the history, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was Walt's first character. He created him with one of his friends and co-animators, and when they split, the co-animator took Oswald. So Walt lost all rights to his own character, which is the backstory behind what Rod was just saying and led to them pursuing patents on things as they went along. Patents and trademarks. And and everybody knows the story recently where Walt Disney just lost the original Mickey Mouse trademark. Through nothing, through no one's fault. So yeah, 2023 was 100 years of the Walt Disney Company, which was... The end 100 of Mickey years. Mouse is, uh, yeah, he no. expired. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, he's still alive. Kids, if you're listening, Mickey's not dead. He's absolutely still there. And you can still meet him. But what does that mean? Does that mean that you can use any image of Mickey Mouse in any way you want to now? No, it does not. So specifically, it's the original Mickey Mouse. It's... Um, what would be referred to as the Steamboat Willie Mickey. Yes. Yeah. So he didn't even have, uh, he mm-hmm. didn't have gloves. He didn't have... Uh, there's a whole series of things yeah (laughs) Yeah. there's a whole series of things that make up that original mickey that is the one that is lost Uh, not lost open Open. to the world yes much better way to put that so that is the version of mickey that is open to public domain now and all current versions or any other version of mickey is still under walt's protection yeah there's there's a, a trademark on everything Mickey and Minnie and Fab Five, they have to in order to pre- uh, protect the brand. Absolutely. But you're right. Things do run out after time. So, Sue, what was the first patent that we found for the Walt Disney Company? So the first one that is that I could find on record as being patented to Disney was what is known as the multiplane camera. It's actually patented under the art on animation camera. And that was in 1940. So this came out of Walt's desire to add realism to animation. He firmly believed that animation could go beyond cartoons, could go beyond uh, a short 
telling of a very small story. So when he did Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1937 was when that was released, he had already invented this camera, which is multi-layers, uh, like literal physical multi-layers going vertically where the camera's at the top and you're shooting through the cells and it, you can move the cells at different rates so that you are actually getting a depth of perspective on an animated project that had never been done before. And he saw a need and invented something to fill that need. Walt was so, so innovative. He never settled for what already existed. It was always about pushing boundaries. It was always about filling a need that no one else had thought of before. So he was, he was definitely into pushing those boundaries and inventing the things that he needed to use. Yeah, another feature that Walt gave to the entertainment industry that's still used to this day for just about every film project you will see, and even stage play, is storyboarding. Now, it's not a patent that Disney holds because it's not a process. It's just a thing that Walt did because Walt needed to be able to tell the story to his animators based on what he saw in his head. And the best way to do that was for an animator to create a quick rough draw of every scene or scene transition and say, okay, I'm going to act out this scene. And you can find video of Walt literally physically acting out the scenes in front of the storyboards that he created for his films. It's amazing that that was not something that happened before 1933, The Little Pigs, I believe, was the 1933, first one. 1933, Three Little Pigs was the very first one that we have record of as being a storyboard. And it was born out of his past as a cartoonist. He had developed cartoon strips. And to take that and use it as a storytelling instrument, it's so brilliant. And it's something that we take for granted today in the film industry. Every film that's made has a storyboard. Well, Every if you, film. If you think about it, Walt, as a storyteller, needed to be able to take something and go from A to Z. So A to B or A to C is something you'll do for a short. You'll have a few scenes. You'll have a few things you can do. But something as large as Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi needed to have multiple, multiple, multiple scenes, and therefore the storyboarding from A through Z made so much more sense to be able to tell the story and keep everybody on the same path from uh, just the storytelling aspect, but from the animation aspect, the production aspect, the direction aspect of it. So yeah, this was in 1933 that he did this. So before that, films were done just from scripts, from people walking into a room and saying, no, it shouldn't look like that. It should look like this. No, we're not going from that scene to this scene. Did you forget we were doing this thing in between? Like there was probably, I mean, I don't have evidence of this, but there was probably a lot of miscommunication because they didn't have a visual for everyone to look at. And it's just, I mean, it's just brilliant. And while we're on the subject, let's just stop to say that Walt invented the very idea of doing an animated feature film. Before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1937, it had not even been attempted. People called it Walt's Folly. They did not think that this was going to be a thing. They went to the theater to laugh at him. And then they Boy, were laughing. Were they were wrong. <laughs> they were not laughing anymore. And the rest is history. Right? So, yeah, any animated feature film to come after is following in his footsteps because he literally dreamt that up. That, it, that that mind of Walt's, I tell you. <laughs> it it really it really is amazing what Walt and the studios came up with for the theaters that didn't exist ahead of time. Uh, surround sound, it was called Fanta Sound. It was created literally for Fantasia and was labeled as Fanta Sound when it was released. Well, theaters couldn't afford this, so Walt had to rent theaters, and like bring... actual theaters, like where you would put on plays. Yeah, yeah. Which at the time, a lot of those theaters were used for both purposes, too. Yes, that is true. And That's true. yeah, uh, it, it uh, became something, again, out of necessity to create Walt's vision in the theater itself. So before this, the, the whole idea of surround sound didn't exist. It was mono and that was it. You would hear the same sounds coming from your left as you would hear coming from your right. There was no depth to it. There was no perspective. So for Fantasia, Walt wanted it to be revolutionary. He wanted it to be a full experience for your senses. He actually wanted, I don't have record that this ever, ever happened because it was a little out there, but he wanted there to be ushers during the film who would walk down the aisles and spray scents or to distribute 
flower petals during the flower. Like he wanted it to be fully engaging. So that was where the sound was sort of a compromise for him to do just the sound and the, the technicolor, which was a, a big thing back then. He also invented technicolor. And which is amazing to me. I didn't realize that that was something that came out of Disney. But again, it came out of Walt's vision that these films need to be in color. Uh, Walt's storytelling capability just still to this day amazes me. The fact that he thought in color, he thought ahead. You know, we see what's in the theaters now, but what else can we do to tell the story? And not just theaters. He was a huge proponent of pushing the the envelope. He wanted to get color TVs into people's homes. He was a big proponent of making them available and inexpensive so that people could see color in their own homes and a big part of that was him doing he filmed the original Disneyland series a lot of those episodes were done in color and when he got into Disney's wonderful world of color that was a big part of pushing that and people needed to have the color in their homes and again that was just so his vision could be fully experienced yeah that sold a lot of televisions back then seriously <laughs> like that's amazing yeah another thing that walt created or the studios created was something called rotoscoping which is basically it allows for fluid movement when you're drawing over live action so you could take a live action uh, film cell expand it and then draw animation over the top of it and it cut down the cost man hour wise for a lot of the Disney films, a lot of in-betweeners could actually do a lot of the scenes because they had those physical cells that they could draw over. Yeah, a lot of it was financially based, like it was just fewer man hours and it was a cheaper process because of that. But also it allowed for such organic movement from the characters. They had a thing going around for a while that they were showing clips where you could see side by side, you could see the live actors doing the dance sequence from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, where they're dancing in the dwarf's cottage. And then next to it would be the overlay of the animation that came out of it. And it's... It's, it's the same thing. I, yeah, yeah, it's basically identical. And then they also reused the same live action sequence to do a sequence in... Uh, Robin Hood with Maid Marian dancing and it's the same live action sequence but they were able to trace the characters that they needed over the same live action really really brilliant and you'd never know that it was the same unless you were comparing them side by side which was not a thing back then <laughs> so very very smart oh I love that everything really for these patents that we have I mean there was over 500 media streaming broadcast patents and 618 animation patents and even 93 virtual amusement patents, because really a lot of what we're going to be talking about now is going to be something that applies to the theme park industry. So again, out of necessity, Walt needed to create all the time. That was his nature to create and to tell stories. And to help with that, in 1963, the very first audio animatronics appeared at Disneyland at the Tiki Room what's now known as Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, to give him the credit for it. Which I love. But I love when, that they did that. Yeah. Oh, it, uh, he deserves it. He really does. He's still the greatest storyteller of our time. It, it amazes me that his, his mind was just such that it, I don't think it ever occurred to him that something couldn't be done. He's known for one of his famous quotes is, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And I think that was literally how he thought about things in the world. He didn't see things as, oh, well, that's never been done. I guess we can't do that. It was, that's never been done. How do we do it? The nice thing was, is Wed actually came up with animatronics for the Tiki Room, but it led into animatronics that then showed up in 64 in It's a Small World at the 64 World's Fair. And now every other place you've seen animatronics anywhere in the world, basically, you can thank Walt for those. That's a pretty well-known one. I mean, I think everybody who is a Disney file knows that the Tiki Room was the first one. And specifically audio animatronics, because they do have that sound element. So that's part, that's part of the patent, as well as that it has that audio element. But yeah, 1963, that Tiki Room started it all off, and Walt wanted it to be a dinner show where the birds would sing to you as you ate dinner, but it evolved into something a little different, and I think we're all the better for it. 
Yeah, that was one of my attractions. I loved being a tiki lead. <laughs> Go ahead. What does it say? Wait. <laughs> I used to have to say, um, wake up, Jose, and don't call me senorita. But, uh, <laughs> he, he always did. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a little sexist myself, but that's anyway. Okay. So other things that you're not going to believe came out of Disney. Now, these are things that were created for Disneyland, but not necessarily by Disney. There was a lot of people Disney brought in around him and through WDI and what was WED at the time that contracted out to other people to help create things for Disneyland. One of the more obscure ones, believe it or not, is Doritos. Doritos chips actually started at the Casa de Fritos in Frontierland at Disneyland. And Casa de Fritos was one of the opening, not opening day, but opening season restaurants. I think it opened about a month later uh, in 1955 and just sort of a walk-up Mexican food restaurant. One of their food distributors was known as Alex Foods. If you're in the SoCal area, you may recognize the Don Miguel brand. And that's where that started. It was originally Alex Foods. One of their distributors came in and saw that they were throwing away tortillas at the end of the night, ones that had gone unused. And he said, if you cut those into triangles and toss them in the fire, you've got chips. So they started doing that and uh, became a big hit with guests. They were giving them away for free as a side item. So their sponsor was, of course, Frito-Lay. Where you could actually go up to a little kiosk-looking thing, put a nickel in, press, press the nickel into the machine, and you would hear the Frito kid go, Hey, Klondike! Hey, Klondike! More Fritos! The best corn chips made! The freshest, too. Crisp, salted, golden brown Fritos. Good anytime. And you would have a little mine car come down with a bag of Fritos for a nickel. I remember that as a kid. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a thing. It was a thing. But I'm not quite old enough to remember that, <laughs> but I've heard the clips. So, <laughs> But they used to give away Fritos free with every meal. After the invention of Doritos, which they were not called Doritos at first, right? They were not. They, were, they didn't have a name. They were just corn chips that they would serve on the side. Eventually, they added the taco seasoning to make them the taco flavor, which is still available in the retro white and yellow bag in stores. And then it evolved into the nacho cheese flavor that we know and love today. As Doritos. <laughs> but they, uh, 1960s is when this happened. In the 1964, um, one of the VPs came in, saw this huge hit that people were eating at his sponsored restaurant that he didn't know anything about. So he got involved and set up a test market in the Southern California area. They were a huge hit there. And 1966, they went national after starting at Disneyland. So if you are enjoying Doritos with your sports ball activities or <laughs> whatever's going score on, points. <laughs> you have Disneyland to thank for that. Another one that you're not going to believe is... Charbroiled hamburgers. Now, hear me out. <laughs> so we've mentioned this before a few times, but there was a restaurant in Anaheim called Carl's Drive-In Barbecue over on Palm Street, which is now known as Harbor Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And Walt frequented this a few times, so he knew of Carl Karcher and his culinary skills. Well, they needed something for the Tomorrowland restaurant in order to serve tons of hamburgers. Well, And to serve them well. And to serve them well. Carl Karcher had come up with a flame broiler that broiled at the top and bottom as the grill moves through slowly with the burger on it. Flame broiled hamburgers. Carl's Jr., as a matter of fact, opened up just a couple years later in 1956, right after Disneyland did. So Walt didn't patent this, but it was something that was used by Disneyland uh, when it was new to create one of the busiest restaurants in the world at the time, the Tomorrowland Terrace. So the flame grilled burgers you get currently at Carl's Jr. if you're west of Oklahoma or Hardee's going the other direction, you can thank Walt and Carl Karcher for that. And I don't know why, but Carl's Jr. is just better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, we, we grew up with it. Well, Hardee's was purchased. It didn't start off as Carl's. So yeah, and it's part. still not. It's just not. Oh. <laughs> the same star. Western different. bacon cheeseburger is still good at both. Yeah. <laughs> so in the world of attractions... Disney really did create, I mean, Main Street, the spoken hub version of a theme park, 
the very idea of a theme park. That's true. The word theme park. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that wasn't just a scattering of rides and hot dog stands, that it was actually based on a theme and had character IP walking around in the park that you could meet Mickey Mouse live and in person. He was slightly terrifying back then, but you could meet him. That, that whole idea is Walt's. Back in the day, though, Walt was looking for a company to help him develop attractions for Disneyland. Now, WED Enterprises at the time has come up with thousands of ideas, but they still needed help in the, in the 50s to create what we know as Disneyland as far as the rides go. There was a company up in Northern California called Aero Development. They had been known to do engineering for different projects, and so Walt hired them and brought them in to help create the attractions for Disney. So things such as the ride pump that we that pushes the boats forward in Pirates of the Caribbean and It's a Small World, the original Dumbo's attraction, the dark ride attractions for Alice in Wonderland, Snow White, Peter, Peter Pan. Pan. Those were all developed by Aero Development with Bob Gurr doing the ride vehicles from WDI or WED and Walt telling the story. As a small side note, if you are not following Bob Gurr on Instagram and you're a Disney fan, you need to be following Bob Gurr on Instagram. It's G-U-R-R, one of the original Imagineers, and uh, designed all the ride vehicles that you know and love. He's still active, still goes around the parks. It's a pretty amazing experience. So just small side note, follow <laughs> Bob Gurr. Very good point. So WDI and WED really do get a lot of the credit for creating a lot of the original attractions, but Aero Development, which later became Aerodynamics, is really the ride manufacturer for Disney at the time. One of the biggest things they did was create the very first tubular steel track roller coaster. We know it today as the Matterhorn bobsleds at Disneyland. In 1959, it opened to rave reviews, and it was a real game-changer in the world of roller coasters. Uh, before that, it was more of a box-type track, almost like a railroad track. And it is really what led to the roller coaster wars of the 1970s, and everything you see today in roller coasters can be traced back to the Matterhorn. It was uh, Ed Morgan and Carl Bacon from Aero Development that really did lead to this development that became like the corkscrew at Knott's Berry Farm is a great example of that. Back in 74, 75 at Knott's, it was the first steel tubular track coaster to go upside down. Aerodynamics came up with that concept. Um, now, is that Morgan like Morgan Trains? That is Morgan Roller Coaster Trains. It is Ed Morgan's company. So, and Bacon and Morgan, is that B&M? No, that's Bollinger and Maviar. Oh, <laughs> that's I good, thought I was on a roll that's there. That's a good catch. Yeah. <laughs> on, on a roller coaster, on a roll. On a roller oh, that, coaster. Was, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> so a few years later, in 67, the Omni Mover was created by Aero Development. Using that same, same tubular steel track, it came out on such attractions as the Adventure Through Inner Space in 67, the Haunted Mansion in 1969, and If You Had Wings in the Magic Kingdom. Yeah, that was a huge, huge game changer. I think at the time, they they didn't even know what they were inventing. I mean, they didn't know the scope of what they were going to be able to do with that. Well, Walt literally took a picture of the Matterhorn, set it on an Imagineer's desk, and said, build this. That's one of my favorite Walt stories. <laughs> but again, it shows in his mind there was no impossible. Exactly. It it's was just, just to find a way to make this work. Find Either find a way to make it work or find somebody that we can get to make it work. Yes. And that's what I love about... Uh, WED or WDI at the time was they did bring in these outside companies and help them create what had never been created. Yes. That was the thing too about Walt is if he couldn't do it, he found the people who could. He was not afraid to go outside of his own little bubble and go to the best. Yeah. Other things at Walt Disney Company or WDI or Walt Disney Productions, all the different company names over the years have, have patented in theme parks. Things like the Smellitizer. <laughs> now, this is actually not something that they patented originally. It was, it's been used on Main Street to pump out caramel smell and popcorn smells and things of that nature. It wasn't really patented until Soren came along in 01. But it pumps out smells based on a, a, a patented way of the air being pushed through the smell out to where you can smell it and then sucked back in. 
so that it can be centralized or compartmentalized within a small area. Except That's for the, the skunk. Pattern. Except for the skunk, for, for some reason, yes. <laughs> that one permeates that whole room. Yeah, thanks, Figment, for that one. <laughs> so we've done a lot of talking about sort of the past and the things that everybody knows and loves. Hopefully a couple of those things surprise you. I know they surprised me. But we're also looking at things that are more current, some current patents that are in things that have come out recently, and some things that they have patents for that we haven't seen an application for yet. So we're sort of excited about those things too. So what do you want to start with? So a couple things that Disney has currently that you're used to seeing are trackless rides, for instance. Pooh's Honey Hunt in 2000 at Disney Tokyo, Tokyo. is commonly thought of as the very first one to use the autonomous uh, style of trackless. But if you think back to 1982, uh, back then even, Energy was a trackless ride that used a guide wire and pucks in the ground. So a little different, but the technology has definitely come up in the industry. You see trackless rides now at many, many parks. Effling just opened up Symbolica. But Disney has also expanded the technology that Pooh's Honey Hunt was the first one, and it's still amazing, but Rise of the Resistance and Ratatouille. Mickey and Minnie's Mickey Runaway, and Minnie's Railway. Runaway Railway. We love that one. But they, they're making such great use and finding out the things that it can still do. One of the amazing things that goes beyond what it started with at Universe of Energy, in that one, it was very large capacity cars that moved through a theater environment and then back into a theater. So the new ones are much smaller, obviously. You've probably been on at least one of those rides that we just mentioned, or at least seen them. But they're able to move independently of one another while knowing where the other cars are. So, for example, in Pooh's Honey Hunt, there's the that's usually just called the Honey Pot Dance. Is that what we call it? it yeah, I don't know what that room is called. It's, it's part of the... Uh, Heffalumps and Woozles scene that you would see in Pooh in either Disneyland or Magic Kingdom. But you you get into this large room and there's different things in the whole area, like different little vignettes, and your car will go to an open one. It knows which ones are open. So you can go on it six times in a row and have six different experiences because your your car is going to go to an open station and everyone else's is going to do the same. And in between times, you dance around the other honeypots. It is amazing. It's amazing technology. Another one of the inventions that is pretty amazing but is in current use is over at DCA, Disney California Adventure, in Avengers Campus. And you're going to find the Stunt Tronic is what they call it. So the Spider-Man animatronic. If you've seen this live and in person, it is amazing. If you haven't, look up a video. It's pretty unbelievable, but the Spider-Man, they have the live, obviously, the real Spider-Man. Right, yeah, there's only one. Yes, yes, and he he lives at Avengers Campus, and he comes out and he does... Universal Studios. No, 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 that's 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 totally different. He's an imposter. Obviously. You sit on a throne of lies. So he comes out and he does a little show with the audience, and then he goes backstage and performs a very impressive Spidey flip. Yeah, you would swear it's human. You would swear it is. The the movement on this thing is incredible. And it's not it's not all done with mirrors. It's not <laughs> smoke and wires. It's an animatronic figure that flips through the air. It is absolutely unbelievable. And this, again, invented by Disney. Yeah, it's led to things like Groot now being able to walk around as a character that's an animatronic. And recently, if you've seen video of what's coming soon for uh, the Zootopia area, that's already open in Shanghai, but future areas possibly for Disneyland even, there is a Judy Hops on roller skates that is a full functioning animatronic robot, and it's interactive, and it can ride itself, and it can roller skate, and the Terminator's real. Seriously, make friends with the robots, folks. Yeah. <laughs> But the the technology behind this is just phenomenal. So those are sort of things that, well, uh, we should talk about the Magic Play play Floor as well. Yeah. That was a thing even way back at the opening of Epcot. Yeah, the the Magic Play Floor is what you would see in the post-show area for Imagination, where you can step onto an instrument and it will play a sound. Or if you go over into the exit area or the post-show area of Spaceship Earth, 
there's a uh, virtual ho- like hockey game that you can play in there. It was also something in, in Disney Quest when it existed at Walt Disney World. I think it exists on some of the cruise ships too. It does. We have seen we've seen it in use in in other places, and this goes back into the 80s now. So the current version of this is from beneath, so you can actually not have to stand on the top of a projection see a uh, shadow. You can now step on the floor, and it will react to your presence. There is a specific Disney patent for this type of technology. It has been duplicated and replicated in other ways as well. So you'll see it in shopping malls and in... Museums. Yeah. It's all not, over the place. It, it, but the technology that Disney has patented, you're going to start seeing more and more of, I think, very shortly in uh, attractions around the world. Yes, and at Disney. <laughs> Speaking of floors, I don't know if you've seen this one, but this one floored me because <laughs> it, it's a floor... <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's called a hollow tile floor. Now, hollow as in H O L O, as in holographic tile floor. And people are also calling it a smart floor. Yeah, but technically, it is called a hollow tile. This thing's insane. It you can you can stand on it for. It was originally developed for virtual reality, mm-hmm. so you could wear a headset and walk in place or run in place, but. The floor tile underneath you knows where you're at and will match the speed of your foot and let you stay in place as you are going through the games. But it's not just a treadmill. It is omnidirectional, not bidirectional, not you can go forwards and backwards. You can go in any direction and it moves with you. So it is the first multi-person, omnidirectional, modular, and expandable treadmill. But think about this. You could actually stand in a queue and not have to walk through the queue. The queue could move <laughs> you along until you get to the ride. The floaty chairs from Wally could like, actually we're seriously be a thing like now. Half a step away from floaty chairs, I swear. Yeah, these the floor itself is programmable. You can stand on it or put a uh, set piece on it. So this has applications in the theme parks, but also think about Disney on Broadway. Moving set pieces now can be done a lot more seamlessly from point to point just by programming the floor to move them. It's incredible. If you haven't seen the clips of this, go on YouTube and find a clip of this because it is, it's pretty mind blowing. And Rod, you had a great idea about having it in the interrogation room. Yeah. Think about this. If they replace the floor in Rise of the Resistance in the cell where Kylo shows up at the top and is, you know, he uses the, the force to try to pull your thoughts or whatever. Think about this as if you were standing on the floor. And when he does that, you literally started to move towards him without ever, you're not moving yourself, but he's moving you. I mean, come on, that would be so awesome. It would be pretty cool. But some of the, some of the things that they'll be able to do with this, I think it's going to revitalize the play pavilion ideas over at Epcot. I think that this is probably going to go in there. The last idea that we had heard for the Play Pavilion was a giant sort of like Wreck-It Ralph internet hub of different things. And I I just have a feeling this is going to be part of that. They haven't really announced what this technology is going to be used for, but they have let us know that it's a thing and that it exists and it is incredible. Another commonly seen thing currently is the new aerial drone show at Disneyland Paris. Well, Disney has patented a thing for these aerial drones that they call a, like a display screen. I'm not well, sure. Well, they're using the... the sky as a display That's screen. That's what it is. Yes. And it's each of the drones becomes its own floating pixel or what they're calling a fixel or a flixel. A flixel. <laughs> so each drone can be close enough that it can have a part of a bigger picture rather than just the outline of a shape. Now, I don't know why they haven't used this in the U.S. yet. It seems like it would have been a perfect thing to use for the 100th celebration or one of the big celebrations. But they did use it for the Paris 30th. So we've gotten to see it in action. It's it's pretty spectacular. Disneyland, though, could use these in the fireworks show very easily. Well, and Disneyland has so many restrictions on when they can do fireworks that this would actually be a good replacement for the nights that they can't do fireworks. And think about how they could use it for even World of Color. At oh my gosh, yeah. Just low-level versions of this. Would that be could be amazing. pretty cool. So lots of applications available for that, I think. A couple other current patents in the works for Disney. They're working on what's called an inverted pendulum coaster. This, this is, is one of those that we haven't seen an application for yet, but we saw the patent. 
So we have our own ideas. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, Tell it, us it, about it. It's a the thought is is that it could be used similar to if you've seen a one of the uh, suspended coasters at theme parks from the older days. So if we're talking about uh, Kings Island, you're talking about the Bat, you're talking about Canada's Wonderland, you're talking about Vortex, Ninja at Six Flags Magic Mountain, kind of give you some things around the U.S. There, Big Bad Wolf, Big Bad Wolf at Williamsburg, yes, at, at Busch Gardens. This is a larger version of that in that the swinging is allowed to be more free swinging out to very very high degrees and it's meant to give the feeling of being on a vine or a web see where i'm going here so (laughs) i mean you could see this being used for a tarzan theme a spider-man theme even zootopia where they're on those vines or um, tangled tangled, yes swinging from her hair pirates swinging from a rope peter pan Yes. Just the feeling of flight. And it, from what I was, I'm not a schematics person. I don't know exactly what we were looking at with the drawing on the patent, but it looked to me like it was also controllable swing, that it wasn't just reliable on gravity. I may have been reading that wrong. I don't know, but it looked pretty cool. Another one of the things that is a futuristic one that we have seen the patent for, but we did not, but we have not seen in action is called the Magic Bench. This one is freaky, and this would be great for the Haunted Mansion. Oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that. I was thinking Celebration Plaza. Oh, yeah. At Epcot, the new one with the Walt statue. But what it is, is it's a regular bench, but when somebody sits down on it, a virtual character appears next to you. An interactive character that you can actually hold a conversation with. It goes hand in hand with another Disney patent that they have right now, which is augmented reality without the use of glasses. Yes. I don't know how they're going to pull this off, and but I can't wait to see the application of it in the theme parks. But how cool would that be? And Rod, when we talked about this earlier, you had a great idea. I was saying, I wonder if you could choose who you're talking to or if just a random character would appear. And Rod, you said... At least at Walt Disney World, where you have your magic band, you have a profile. So on your profile is your favorite character already. So Disney knows or the the system would know who your favorite character is and that character could then appear automatically talking to you next to you. How cool would that be to sit down on a bench and suddenly I could have a conversation with the Cheshire Cat? I just think that's awesome. Who knows what kind of trouble he would get me into, but, you know, (laughs) it would be fun. And if you didn't have a favorite, just, you know, one of the Fab Five or it would be super cool if Walt was one of the options to sit down and just have share a bench with Walt would be amazing. Another one that they're working on right now, patent-wise, is called a mood sensor. This one kind of freaks me out. <laughs> this one's a little weird, but think of an animatronic locking eyes with you, which is a different Disney patent as well. Which they already own. Which they already own. They can have an animatronic basically see your face and, and lock eyes with you. The system, being whatever ride system or computer system is looking at you, would be able to determine your mood. If you're on the Haunted Mansion and you're scared, they could back off some of the jump scares or things for you. If it was something like the old ending for Horizons, where you were in the vehicles and you were having so much fun in the space part, but not as fun in the underwater, it could automatically choose something for you based on the mood that the system detects that you're in at the time. That's creepy. But so cool. But I love it. (laughs) But creepy. But creepy, (laughs) yes. So the idea of being able to determine a ride's outcome or the actual pattern of the ride based on how you're reacting to it. I mean, that's kind of brilliant, but creepy. But creepy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so it's Black History Month. So let's call out one of the most amazing inventors with WDI, Lanny Smoot. He is an inventor. He is particularly relevant today because he just this year... In the last two months, he's been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. He joined Disney in 98, but he's been an inventor for literally his whole life. When he was a kid, his dad brought him a light bulb. What was it? A, a light bulb and a switch. Yeah. And, and, and he, when, the, or it was a, when a bell went off, then you would, the light would come on. And so he he engineered that at a young age. Yes. He figured out how to make one thing affect the other thing and was hooked. He automatically just gravitated towards how things work and how to make them better. So in 2021, he received his 100th 
career patent. That's that that's incredible. A hundred patents go to this single man. And it was what we just talked about, the magic play floor. Yes, the magic play floor is one of his um, one of them, <laughs> when they asked him which one he wanted to display as his National Inventors Hall of Fame exhibit, he chose Where's the Fire? Which, <laughs> from from, from Communicore. Yes, yeah, from Communicore from and Epcot. I mean, yeah. It was there for, I, I believe, roughly about 10 years, and it was an interactive feature in Communicore where you would walk through a house and you had these like flashlights. But the flashlights would show you through the walls. So you would shine it around the room and you would see potential fire hazards inside the walls and things to avoid in your own home to avoid causing fires. So it was very, very edutainment. But the technology behind it was just amazing. I I had no idea how it worked when we did it as kids, (laughs) but very, very cool. Another one of the things that he's known for is the interactive scavenger hunts that you find all over Epcot. He did the one at Disney Seas. It, that one blew my mind when we saw it. It's in Japanese, but we saw the effects going off all over the place with people playing the game. Lanny, you're a genius. He's seriously a genius. But the, just the, the kids' ones that are all over Epcot where you go and you find Perry the Platypus or you find Figment or all the things that um, you interact with on your phone and pieces of technology you you cause the waterfall to move aside to show you the sword or you cause a wheel to spin or a doll to move in one of the windows all of those things he's responsible for those interactive scavenger hunts and my personal favorite thing that made me so endeared to mr smoot oh probably dr smoot i don't know that for sure but i'm just gonna (laughs) give him an honorary title if he's not (laughs) How about Sir Smoot? He's been, Sir. We'll, we'll knight him as well. Sir, Sir Smoot. Smoot. Sir Smoot, we honor you. But my personal favorite that made me so endeared to him is he is responsible for the technology behind the lightsaber experience on the Star Cruiser and the extendable lightsaber. The he one that Ray created the real one. Oh, the real so cool. lightsaber that actually extends out of the hilt. That's him. He did that. So he is the first inventor from disney to be inducted into the national inventors hall of fame since walt disney himself that is beyond impressive how cool is that so lanny smoot we salute you you are amazing sir well folks that is our list of things that disney has invented that we were surprised even on some of them there's so many more like we over 6,000 patents. We cannot go over everything those are some of the ones that we particularly like the ones that really impressed us the most yeah So let us know if you know of any others down in the comments. We'd love to know what we didn't say, but probably would love to know that it was created by Disney and (laughs) didn't know that we knew that we knew that you knew that I know. They don't know that we know they know we know. (laughs) Before we go, we'd like to give a big thank you to our social media coordinator, Riley Piper, audio engineers Joey Humphrey and Paul Trett, logo designer Evan Piper, and our theme music composer, Jason Patrick Rowan, whose music is licensed through Pond5. And of course, thank you, Phoenicians. Thank you, Phoenicians. And don't forget to rate, review, like, and subscribe. It really, really does help other people find us. You can find us on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. The Up Coast Adventure is a $1,000 brunch production and a proud gold member of D23. Thanks for joining us today for episode 52 of the Up Coast Adventure. I'm Rod. And I'm Sue. And we'll see you live. What's good? Another bag of Fritos, Klondike. Okay, coming right up. One bag of crisp salted Fritos.